Now we're going to ch chat with Mark Amender uh, of The Atlantic magazine and certainly one of our crack political consultants here at CBS News. Hey, Mark, where are you, by the way? Uh, Katie, I'm in the Delaware delegation, uh, which was uh, seated in the nosebleed uh, portion of the auditorium until a certain senator from Delaware was chosen uh, as Barack Obama's vice presidential nominee. And of course, they moved it right up to the front. All right, yeah, obviously it went from the nosebleed section, as Jeff said, with America, Samoa, all the way to the front of the convention hall. So, Mark, I was just going to ask you a couple quick questions. Sure. Um, first of all, because you are just uh, are so knowledgeable about all things political, I wanted to ask you about some key battleground states looking sure. ahead beyond these conventions. Now, the Democrats are really focusing on a number of states that haven't elected a Democratic presidential candidate since 1964, those being, I believe, Virginia. Virginia and Indiana. Is that right, Mark? That Indiana, 1968. Yeah, correct. 1968 or 1964? I think Indiana is 68, Virginia is 64. Okay, I don't know. Brian but, Goldsmith is disagreeing with you. Right. We're going to have to get okay. back to folks on that. We'll have a But do there. you think there's a chance that either of these states could go Democratic this go round? Um, both of them could. Virginia is more likely. The demographics of Virginia are changing, and Northern Virginia um, is. Uh, an area where Republicans, particularly conservative Republicans, are doing worse and worse and worse. Voter registration among Democrats has increased. Uh, and um, just a, a state where uh, the right Democratic candidate could, for the first time, uh, turn it blue. Hey, Mark, I was going to ask you, I, I can't find on my page, but this was from, I believe, a DIG user or maybe somebody on CNET. You know, Barack Obama was a huge sensation back in 2004 when he gave the keynote address. This is usually reserved for an up-and-comer. And the question from this Internet user who wasn't naughty boy, that's a question I'm going to ask for, ask Joe and Dan about, uh, just so, so I can say naughty boy on the web, if not on television, but was who was kind of the up-and-coming star of this convention and my answer of course was the keynote the keynoter this year Mark Warner do you think that's true absolutely in fact so much is he a, a rising star that last month Barack Obama's vice presidential vetting team including uh, Caroline Kennedy tried to convince him to allow him uh, submit him his records to be vetted Obama really wanted to consider him uh, for the ticket Warner cited his promise to voters of Virginia he uh, disappointed uh, many Democrats when he decided not to run for president. He clearly uh, is the future of the party in Virginia. All right. Mark Amador, I'm going to get back to you. Can you stay tuned? Actually, you can maybe uh, chime in on this question. Sure. Uh, Joe and Dan, are you guys still there? How are you, though? I'm, I'm here. here okay, Joe, so. Dan's not here. <laughs> Trippy's here. Just oh, okay. All right, Joe Trippy. No, no. Then I'm going to ask you oh, this. Are, is Dan there? Well, he can get hooked up and ready to go. It's fine. Uh, but I wanted I don't have to. Have a camera, though. You don't have a camera. No. Oh well, this can be radio on the okay. web, you know. We can do that. <laughs> oh hi, Joe. You can come over here actually and sit next to me, and I'll keep talking okay. to Amateur. Uh, okay. So, Mark, this is a question from Dig. This is a guy whose uh, web name is Naughty Boy. That I just found that just. Uh, something I couldn't resist. And his question, Mark, is, as we see Joe get up here and, and get hooked up, is will we see increased funding for renewable energy solutions? I think that's an emphatic yes when you're talking about the Democrats, isn't it, Mark? And it's also an emphatic yes uh, when it comes to the Republicans. Barack Obama has proposed a lot more uh, spending on renewable energy. He has proposed uh, a, um, a essentially what amounts to an Apollo project uh, named after, of course, the Apollo moon landing, but an Apollo, Apollo project dedicated to finding renewable energy resources to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars over 10 years. John McCain has what he calls the Lexington project, which is very similar. So under Democratic or Republican administration, you'll see a lot more spending from the government on renewable resources. Okay, Mark, stand by, because I'm going to go to Bob Schieffer, who's at the podium. Hi, Bob. I didn't Howdy. mean to forget about you. I haven't talked to you for a while. Well, you know, I'll tell you something. A couple of other reporters came along here, and I just talked to them. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Hi, you guys. I'm actually doing a live webcast, so I can't really talk to you guys right now, but maybe later. And I can't hear a darn thing, because I have these uh, earplugs in my ear. But, Bob, listen, I wanted to get your comments from a web user, a dig user, and it's in 19... This right, user writes, it's N-U-R, I can't really, I-E-U-R-E. -E. I'm sorry, I can't really pronounce that name. As long as it's not Naughty Boy, yeah. I don't take those. <laughs> yeah. 
1984, this uh, user writes, Barack Obama was 23, McCain was 48. How big of an issue is age in this election? And Bob, I ask you this question as the elder statesman of CBS News, but certainly because we were talking about the exhausting nature of running for president in this day and age. So how much an issue do you think age is and will be in this campaign? Well, I've always thought that John McCain's age is an asset because John McCain and I are the same age. Uh, but I think it is a legitimate uh, question. I think it is a legitimate issue, and I think it is a question that uh, John McCain is going to have to deal with. This is the hardest job in the world. John McCain is going to be 72 years old when he's, if he is elected. Uh, he will be the oldest president uh, sworn in. And uh, it's, it's a killer job. He's got to assure people and reassure them that he's up to it, that, he, that from a standpoint of health, that he's able to do it. So uh, people will make their decision on that. But I think it is a perfectly legitimate question to raise and, and an issue that uh, I, I, I know for sure John McCain is going to have to deal with. Yeah, and, and Bob, stand, stand by for a moment because I have one final question for a, our inaugural webcast, which has to do with technology, which makes sense, don't you think, Joe? And I'd love to get your take on this as well, Bob. And, and a, a dig user, I mean, these names are killing me, you guys. I want you all to change your name. It's Delazic. I'm sorry, D Slazic, maybe? D S L A Z Y K. I just want you to know we know who you are and we're using your question. But the question is have you ever Googled yourself? Which sounds a bit obscene. If so, did you find out something new about yourself or something you did not want online? Well, I can answer that emphatically. <laughs> yes, I've Googled myself, and I've learned not to Google myself because uh, it is not a pretty picture. And before we talk to Joe, wait, Bob, I have to ask you, have you Googled yourself? No, but let me tell you this, I, and this is absolutely true. I, I walked into our uh, um, little office that we have uh, my, at our home where my wife and I uh, live and she was sitting at the uh, at the uh, computer there and and I said any Google alerts for me today and she said I've got a lot more to do than sit around and Google you. <laughs> how about, how, yeah, that's kind of a diss spot. How about you? Have you Googled yourself? Be honest. It's yes, kind I of have. embarrassing Absolutely, to admit it. I have, have you Googled yourself uh, lately? No. Yeah. Have you learned not to Google yourself? Yeah, because it drives you crazy. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, but the, the other thing is, uh, it's also amazing what, what, when you say something, you see how it reverberates out there and how many people are actually talking about, like this webcast. Uh, how many people will be talking about it tomorrow, and you can see that in Google Alerts and when you Google it. So it's in that sense, it's always interesting. But you get the, you always get the pluses and the negatives. Well, that's why it's really heart. important, I think, to correct the record. Like right. if something false is written about you, like a few years back, they all said I had a laparoscopic brow lift. I don't really even know what that is, but I think it involves putting hooks in your head and mm. lifting your forehead. But this got repeated in like several publications, and finally I said enough. No mas. I went to the initial publication. I said, dudes, write a correction because this yeah, is going to live in perpetuity on the web and it's completely bogus. So, but, but actually, this leads to a more serious question in conclusion, <laughs> which is how do you think the internet has changed the face <laughs> of not only campaigns but campaign coverage in this country? I mean, it's changed it enormously, yeah, hasn't no, it? The, and the, the difference just between 2004 and 2008. I mean, in 2004, we didn't have YouTube, we didn't have Facebook, MySpace, all these things, that, social networks that we take for granted today that have grown into millions uh, and, you know, hasn't happened, uh, didn't exist. And now you see these, uh, the huge numbers that the Barack Obama campaign has, uh, I mean, just the millions of people that have connected right. uh, and can get involved and can make a difference. And it is changing journalism, too. I it's mean, really all... changing the news cycle. Yes. It, it's, it's truncating it into a nanosecond. There used to yeah. be, you know, a period of hours, even perhaps a day, Absolutely. where the news cycle could kind of uh, spin. And now but it's... now it's instantaneous response, and all the news comes so fast and furious. It's hard to keep up with it in a way. No, and not only that, you have all these other people out there who can who can literally find a new fact, change or, or catch a politician in yeah, a moment, right. and just destroy a career or something. I mean, you really change the entire news cycle. Just one 
American. Who can catch George Allen yeah, saying macaca on his cell phone Absolutely. or on a small portable Absolutely. camera? Hey, Bob, I'm curious because you've covered politics for a long time. How have you how have you seen technology change the way you and we, our, our entire uh, sort of profession, do business? Well, I mean, it's this this stuff that goes around the world in a nanosecond, you know. I mean, when I talk to journalism students now, and I tell them that when I used to be a newspaper reporter at the old Fort Worth Star-Telegram, a big part of the job was being able to find a telephone uh, to phone the story in. If you couldn't find a phone, you didn't have a story. Now everybody has got a cell phone. I'll tell you one little anecdote, uh, Katie. Uh, a young woman who worked for me, my uh, research assistant, uh, Michelle Levy, uh, who's now working in our political unit as a producer, when she came to work for me, uh, one of our friends gave me one of those portable typewriters like we used to all carry uh, covering political campaigns. Michelle didn't know what it was. She'd never seen a typewriter. In <laughs> so now that's when you realize you've been around for a while, but that's how fast this thing, how fast all of this is moving. And, you know, frankly, none of us knows uh, where, where it's going to go. We don't know if we're going to have newspapers. We don't know if everybody will get all their news on an iPod. We don't know where it's going to go, but we think that uh, there will always be a need for uh, accurate information and for reporters.